Limbo. The unrelenting captivity of the present, when who you were is no longer who you are. In the reins of change only grow weeds. What do you become? The answer is found through uncertainty, and the only way to handle that burden is to carry it. Probably. A man wearing a live animal on his head sulks in the rain. Ah, love, in its various deadly shootings. This intro slaps, by the way. It's happening in space. That guy's name is Spike. This ship's name is Bebop. That guy's name is Jet. And they're bounty hunters who eat weird salad because they are poor. They are poor because Spike is a lunatic with destructive tendencies. Jet convinces Spike to chase after a syndicate guy by bribing him with the reward of meat. Big light hole. They are fleeced by bureaucracy. Spikey flees on his little spaceship. The prey enters a bar full of complaining old men. There's some kind of purple mischief happening here. It's a drug called Bloody Eye. These guys aren't too happy about it. Tarzan gets high on his own supply and is shot at. He goes berserk and slaughters his assailants Matrix style. Spike gets turnt and watches a weird old guy play with some sand. The wizard spouts mumbo jumbo about death and Tarzan's cool pregnant wife. Spike casually admits to being killed by a woman already and pieces out. Jed is helping himself to a brewski when some thugs related to Tarzan's rampage reveal their social security numbers through conversation to him. They're after the bloody eye. Jet decides to get information his way. Meanwhile, Spike and his boat are hungry. By sheer coincidence, the plot lines cross. His name is Asimov. Spike eats a stranger's cigarettes. They flirt. Spike is from Mars. Literally. The woman reveals that she is headed to Mars. They didn't meet by coincidence at all, it seems. Spike isn't interested in fighting, however. Asimov goes for the kill, but Prego Babe spares him. Yoink. They flee. Jet wakes Spike from his nap and laments about their Mark's wiliness. Spike has already planned 35.3 steps ahead, and Jet is unsurprised. The trio of seething senility heralds the battle to follow. Spike cosplays as a Spaniard and spooks Asimov. They fight. Spike is pretty good, but the couple have a pretty high wanted level in GTA, so they get going. The Baroness of Babes isn't pregonant after all, and Cusco's poison is scattered to the floor. Jet saves Spork, who then violently explodes a couple of goons pursuing the bloody eye buddies. They fly around to some smooth jazz. Tarzan absorbs the juice and is JFK'd by Miss Kennedy. The two of them are blown to smithereens by the entire Chicago police force. Later, Spike does karate in his garage to forget the trauma. A man named Abdul Hakim and his quivering box are flushing his clothes down a toilet when he is beset upon by some scientists. They are swiftly defeated. Spike watches Blazing Saddles on TV while approaching Mars. This Abdul guy is a wanted criminal with a large bounty. The Bebop gets a call from Albert Einstein who barters with Spike on a price for Abdul's abduction. There is intrigue about the contents of Abdul's briefcase. Abdul is picked on for being tall, so he squishes a bug to assert his dominance. A thief made off with his precious handbag. He beats a meat in frustration. There was some kind of feral creature in there this whole time. Spike deploys and gathers information about a pet shop. By sheer coincidence, he and the thief meet at said shop. Spike mistakes him for Abdul and forces a clown to open the case. It's a corgi. Spike passes the real Abdul on his way out. Abdul is ferociously mauled by the corgi, which alerts his pursuers and causes a chase scene. The corgi goes fast. Abdul throws a fruit for some reason. Eventually, Spock and Abdulert collide and have a good old fashioned bridge brawl. Uh, this happens. Spike is furious. The Bebop has a new crewmate. Abdul's afro is reeled onto shore by a child. Much like a Lovecraftian creature, he emerges, mumbles esoteric gibberish, and dispatches the civilians. The scientists reveal that the corgi is a data dog, which contains all their dark secrets. Jet and Spike lay a trap. Abdul makes a phone call, but is not pleased by the response. He is seduced by a fortune teller and his little bird. The scientists use their moving toaster to emit an alluring dog call. Every hound in the city is summoned, and yet another chase ensues. 
Abdul obliterates a groom and hijacks their wedding car. Corgi is elusive, but is chloroformed by Hakim. Spike takes flight and joins the caucus. He dry humps the car and gets shot at. The Corgi begins to pilot Abdul's vehicle, then yeets off a bridge. Spike swoops in for the rescue, while the pursuers also yeet themselves off a bridge. They are arrested sometime later. The news reveals that data dogs are apparently really smart. Spike doesn't like dogs. It's Mars time again. A woman wearing half a banana flirts with an old war veteran. Some folks aren't too happy about that and capture her after a brief gunfight. She's apparently a legendary gambler. A pervy rich guy gets handsy and gives her the choice of jail time or indentured servitude. He must be this massive floating roulette's proprietor. Spike and a mysterious well-dressed man discuss philosophy in the casino's elevator. Bonk eats a cigarette in response. The triad of prophetic pensioners foreshadow the chaos to follow. Spike is enjoying his downtime and encounters the captured gambler woman. He is here to do some kind of shady deal and for some reason the head honcho of this shindig decided to let this murderous wildcard woman be the one to oversee it. Looks like we have a classic look-alike situation, and a double trouble trope where they swap possessions accidentally. Spike is accosted, but confused, as he should be. He asserts his moral dominance by consuming the valuable chip. The security shows up to make an arrest, but are vegetated. Bobcut Banana Babe knows when the chips are down and makes an escape. Jet gets involved in Spike's shenanigans. An orb with wings arrives to pick up its child from school. Explosion. The orb now has three children to nurture. The casino guys figure out what happened and get going. Back on the bebop, they've got the felon in cuffs. She mentions that chip again, and Spike reluctantly regurgitates it into Jet's tender hands. Spike doesn't want to hear any of this chip nonsense anymore, and they leave her locked up. Jet finds some truth in their prisoner's words. She does some Doctor Who devilry with her lipstick. The Gigababe on TV tells them about Faye Valentine, who looks suspiciously like their captive. Faye used that tube to contact her boss, so now he knows. The lads figure they should turn Faye into the police and tell her about her bounty. She is disappointed in her bounty not exceeding her debt, then makes an attempt at persuasion by bringing up her gypsy heritage. It doesn't work. The Space Mafia wants their circle back. Jet reads a Wikipedia article saying that the chip is essentially a skeleton key for any protection code. That makes sense for such a high value item. Jet cleverly bargains a selling price for it, and the fancy pervert agrees to his terms. Meanwhile, Faye has skedaddled. Spike dons the Red Power Rangers apparel and goes to conduct business. Faye is brutally maimed by their resident guard dog. The Mafia boss has evil intentions, which Spike's spidey senses detect. Faye got her Orbimobile back. Spike sends his aggressor into the infinite speckled abyss of space, snatches the chip back, then is robbed by the gypsy. Faye pieces out. The Mafia retaliate by launching a barrage of missiles, which are skillfully redirected back to the sender. Spike admires the psychotic woman's explosive painting. The space cowboys decide to relax by indulging in more gambling. Faye slurps some space juice while adrift. There's a dead robot space snail. Jet and Spike order a fancy dinner. Bingo. Boy spotted. An old woman openly admits to participating in shady business practices. Fat Jesus done messed up. Now mama's gonna stab her salad real hard. Jet uses his x-ray vision to identify a man named Morgan. This Morgan fellow upsets the rodent queen by insulting the quality of his baked rat. He is ruthless gunned down by the Mouseketeers. I guess they're some kind of terrorist organization who engage in xenophobic violence for the sake of their dolphin overlords. They call themselves the Space Warriors. Jet remembers that the Rat Queen's bounty is a hefty sum, and Spike teleports next to her. The pups are enraged, but are convinced to flee before the police arrive. Meanwhile, Faye finds a man in that snail, who with his dying breath, he entrusts her to deliver a briefcase to the ISSP. The Space 
Space Warriors are revealed to be a radicalized collection of environmentalists who are obsessed with the preservation of Ganymede sea rats. Her name is Twinkle Murdoch. Sort of unfortunate to be called Twinkle. That's so close to being Tinkle. Jet finds out that her bounty was cancelled. Faye peeps on the loot from Robo Snail. These fine gentlemen are important somehow. The terrorists got the Ganymede government to surrender. Faye is upset that she can't eat the bomb and is rescued by the sheer power of plot. She is restrained and robbed. Spike finds the mystery thingy-majig. This guy implies that it's a virus. Spike attempts to release the probably dangerous virus into their humble spaceship. Jet converses with his good old pal Bob about the cancelled bounty. Bob is only interested in boobers, but Jet has a pretty high charisma level, so Bob folds and reveals all. The eco-terrorists made a virus that turns people into monkeys and currently has the entire population of Ganymede held as hostages. Twinkle is worried. Spike nearly unleashes super monkey aids onto the world and they release Tinkle. Twinkie recites biblical prose to the cowboys and drifts away menacingly. She contacts the president and threatens to turn the planet into monkeys. The police chase after the radicalized rodentia but that was a decoy full of bombs. Twinkle begins projecting her propaganda across all television channels and ejects her doomsday monkey torpedo. Her bounty is reinstated and the bebop is back in action. Faye has escaped again. Spike goes the wrong way on the hyperspace highway and uses his sick beam to blast two of the three monkey missiles. Faye is a staunch businesswoman and doesn't miss a chance to make a quick buck, negotiating for 60% of the bounty to get that last bomb. It turns into a flock of monkeys. She is shook. Ganymede decides to close their gaping portal. Spike and Faye spew forth from hyperspace like a salmon through a tube. Faye is ridiculed for being afraid of the resulting ghost missiles. Everyone knows about the ghost missiles. The terrorists are turned into monkeys. Faye makes herself at home. This guy forms a blood pact with the Japanese Agent Smith. They're some sort of mobsters. Big yikes. Sephiroth murders everyone and finds out that Spike is alive somewhere. Spikey decides to go after that dead guy, and Jet is concerned. Away he goes, ignoring Jet's unease. Faye is a pest, then snags a whiff of that sweet gig from the television. She slinks into an opera being attended by Mao Yin Rai, Spike's target. Faye was expected and immediately arrested. A big woman and Spike beat up a couple of perverted children. Her name is Annie, and she's an old friend and recovering alcoholic who thought Spike was dead. He inquires about their old pal Mao, causing her to quiver with emotion. Sephiroth appears before Faye and asks if she is trembling for some reason. He declares himself to be a man named Vicious. How dark and foreboding. Spike receives a weapon, counsel to avoid Vicious, and the spirit of Mao through the consumption of hard liquor. He prepares for battle while Jet informs him of his assured folly. Spike admits that Mao was a homie. Jet is shook. Faye shows up at the Zoom meeting with her clown nose and announces her position as a hostage. Spike is delighted to have more reasons for violence, and Orlando is a pretty good place to have a scrap between homicidal gangsters. Vegas soliloquizes Bible verses in a Shakespearean fashion. They discuss the past, present the hostage, and begin their shootout. Faye breasts boobily to avoid various projectiles. Spike throws explosives and goes nuts, but is wounded on the stairs. Jet accidentally butchers his bush, gets a call from Faye, and becomes enraged. Vicarious equips his dragon scimitar, and the two dance gracefully to a standstill. They communicate to each other in poems. Essentially, Vicious and Spike are very similar. However, Spike managed to escape his old life of endless brutal violence where Vicious did not. Spunk gets his face grabbed and is thrown through a window. He hallucinates figures of his past, throwing flower petals and wearing skin-tight latex together in the rain. There were good times, bad times, and all the blood and guts in between. Spike pulled a sneaky and finessed a grenade onto Vicious. He awakens on a wooden cart headed to his execution for illegally attempting to cross the border. It was a fleeting caress of a dream, however, and he returns to find Faye, who tells him that she mummified him. Spike is ungrateful and returns to the soil. POV, you are abducted by aliens. Uh, I wish I was that horrible. I guess Spike was cybernetically enhanced or something. At least Ayn has something to eat. Faye is a monster. Pike and Net are after a guy named Giraffe. Jet distracts future me while Spike goes for the quarry. 
Giraffe is jealous of that guy's rad wheels. They form a sneaky conga line on the way to a hotel. Girth gets aggressive with the disabled man called Zebra and is eated through a window. Spike saves him though, I guess not. Giraffe offers Spike a side quest, then dies. Jet gives the Ring of Power a good look, and they all discuss what to do about it. Faye is handed a rental invoice. Jet and his chubby chum eat a million cakes and discuss Giraffe. He was after the harmonica child named Wynn, and was also part of an elite squad of fighters with Zebra. The two of them decided to take over a nondescript facility and were betrayed somehow. Spike trails the perpetrator to a warehouse. Jet and Faye unearth some weird time travel nonsense from a news article from 30 years ago. Spike is shot by the freaky immortal kid. The harmonica boy gets molested by sun aliens in a flashback and emerges from his progenitor's lightly fried husk as an immortal being. Retrieving Zebra was the objective all along. Baby Sauron wants his ring pop back and goes ballistic. He uses the disabled as a shield and is domed shortly after. Ah, the curse of immortality. Back at the bebop, Zebra cries manly tears as his memories are uploaded onto TikTok. They find out that the demon child Wynn's weakness has something to do with the quest item that Giraffe dropped when he died. The ring contains some sci-fi voodoo, so Jet makes it into a bullet. Spike loves killing children and goes waku waku in delight. Faye thinks Spike is gonna die for some reason. He absolutely obliterates Peter Pan in a gratuitous explosion. The immortal kid has immortal clothes as well. He's also a bad shot and takes one to the forehead. Wynn is pleased by the comforting shroud of death's cloak. Spike doesn't relate. A flying Toblerone soars through space to the crisp sounds of heavy metal. Space Cat. Scat. These folks are space truckers. Spuckers. This woman's name is VT. She rumples stiltskins his act and fleeces the poor fool. An old biker regales his mulletlets of tales from his glory days. VT visits her watering hole and gets the latest scoop. There's a bounty in the area, and the hunters are out on the prowl. Spike is hung over in the bathroom stall, whereas Faye is miserable in a Chuck E. Cheese. The prey is seduced by her provocative crawling around and is ensnared in her web. I guess she got the wrong guy. Some mariachis sexually harass a waitress who is saved by VT's superior morals. The actual wanted man flees in panic, but is spotted due to his cowardly jitters. Faye quickly strips the pinned wretched little nerd, revealing his dastardly anti-authoritarian tattoo. A bar fight ensues as Spike spills his egg. Spike and VT skillfully dispatch the Hispanic hooligans. Faye is exploded by an orange tic tac. She kneels in defeat. VT has a prejudice towards bounty hunters. Ayn is fed beans. TV treats Spike to an egg and gunk. She comments on her husband being the only other person to have such a foul concoction. Oh no, anyone but these guys. All they bring is calamity. They utterly fail at guessing her name. Spike gets an email that outs him for being a dirty bounty hunter and is exiled by VT. His boat was vandalized by the poncho pals. Big sad. Spike proffers VT for a ride and is verbally attacked. The valorous kitten cat makes a strong defense, causing VT to give. VT's cannibal corpse is upsetting the hose. Back on the bebop, the crew is discernibly hostile towards each other. The heavy metal queen rallies her collective of truckers to avenge their comrades' place in line at the hyperspace gate. Ah, the culprit is coincidentally the wanted criminal our protagonists are after. Spike warns VT about the explosive pills that Austin Powers is packing, but she continues her pursuit. Spike heads out. VT is bombed, but evasive. Domino's, or whatever his name was, crashes into a wall and suffocates in the cold expanse of space. VT is alright though. Unfortunately, that guy's spicy sausages are about to go off inside a highly unstable asteroid filled with randomly combusting reactors. They opt to delicately tow her space wagon out of the tube, and they're trapped. Faye recovers the fetal nukes to blow up the rubble. Spike carefully sets up an elaborately timed explosive and goes for a spacewalk. Something over there has some suck to it. He uses the momentum of gunfire to get a clutch W. They are ejected from the asteroid. Spike discovers VT's real name from her husband's locket. Victoria Tepsi... Tepi... Tepsico... Tepsicore? Wife of the legendary bounty hunter Tepic... Tes... 
Teriyaki, Spike rejects the victory money in favor of buying her dead husband some of that weird egg juice he had earlier. And that's the end of part one of Cowboy Bebop. Hello? Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, um, give it a like. And if you want to see more, subscribe. Also, if you really want, you can buy me food on my Patreon. I've linked a bunch of stuff in the description for that. Thanks again. Uh... Bye.